evening, everyone. Thank you for being here. I'm Madeline Rosenberg. I'm the Public Humanities Specialist here at the Library, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here tonight and introduce tonight's program. I want to start by thanking all of you for joining us, both in person and online. And I also want to add that this program is presented with support from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Tonight's hybrid event will run for about one hour. We will hear from our Isabella Morales in conversation with Martha A. Sandweiss about her new book, Happy Dreams of Liberty, An American Family and Slavery and Freedom. Following a conversation between the speakers, we will reserve about 15 minutes at the end for Q&A with both our in-person and virtual audiences. So, our Isabella Morales is an author and public historian. She is the editor and project manager of the Princeton Slavery Project and the Digital Projects Manager at the Stoutsburg Sauerland African American Museum, Central New Jersey's first Black History Museum. Morales received her PhD in History from Princeton University in 2019, specializing in slavery and emancipation. She received her BA in History and American Studies from the University of Alabama, where she began the research that would become Happy Dreams of Liberty in an undergraduate history seminar. Happy Dreams of Liberty is her first book, and I also want to add that Isabella is a wonderful member of the library's own Humanities Council, so we're especially happy to have her here tonight. Martha A. Marnie Sandweiss is Professor of History at Princeton University and the founder and director of the Princeton and Slavery Project. She's the author of Passing Strange, a Gilded Age Tale of Love and Deception Across the Color Line, and the author or editor of numerous other works on the history of photography and the history of the American West. So I just want to go over a few brief housekeeping items before we begin the program. This room is T-coil enabled, so if you have a T-coil enabled device, please feel welcome to switch it on at this time. If you don't have such a device but would like to use one of our headsets, we have a few available on the piano over there. Please note that masks are optional in the library, and we encourage you to do whatever makes you feel comfortable. For those of you on Zoom webinar, we recommend that you use the Zoom app rather than the browser-based version for your experience. Please note that this event is being recorded and our recordings typically are uploaded onto our YouTube channel at a later date. And if you have thoughts or comments throughout the program, if you're on Zoom tonight, please enter them in the chat box. If you have a question that you would hope we would get to at the end, please put them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen so that we can distinguish what we do. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to turn things over to Marty. Thank you so much. Thank you, Madeline, and thank you all for coming out tonight. Before we launch, can you just explain what it felt like to hold your first book in your hand for <laughs> oh the very goodness. first time? Oh my goodness, I, I can't explain it. I've been working on this in various forms since I was an undergraduate at the University of Alabama. As Madeline said, that's you know more than 10 years now. Um, I know when I started researching it, I never expected it would get to this point, and I'm so delighted to have, have made it the, <laughs> to having a published book and especially to be kind of launching it with my first book talk here at the library. I um, I attended graduate school in Princeton. I've lived in the area for about 10 years now. And so I have been to a lot of these talks at the library. They are always fantastic. And, and I knew that if I could get here one day, I would have made it. So I'm, I'm delighted that the library welcomed me here for this event and as well as Labyrinth and Not in Our Town Princeton for co-sponsoring it. I'm, I'm really just thrilled. Well, there's lots to get into here, but um, let me ask you just to begin Pretend you're flying up in a drone, looking down at your story. Can you just give us the most basic kind of overview of the, the narrative arc of your book? Absolutely. So this is the story of the Townsend family. And the Townsends were the children of two white cotton planter brothers, Samuel and Edmund Townsend, and several enslaved women that they owned on their vast Alabama plantations in the decades before the Civil War. Now, under the law of slavery in the United States, slavery followed the condition of the mother. That meant that no matter who your father was, black or white, slave or free, a poor farmer, or the president of the United States, if your mother was an enslaved woman, you were born into slavery as well, which meant that Samuel and Edmund's children weren't just their children, they were also their property. And that led to a really interesting dynamic within the family because Samuel and Edmund never married. They had no legitimate children to carry on the family legacy. In their minds, their enslaved children were their rightful heirs. So when Edmund died in 1853, believing that his children were superior to other enslaved people by merit of their Townsend blood, 
he left a will bequeathing his $500,000 estate to his four enslaved children, two daughters and two sons. Now that will didn't hold up in court, but when Samuel, the younger brother, died a few years later in 1856, he left a very similar will, leaving his $200,000 estate to his nine enslaved children and Edmund's two enslaved uh, daughters, his nieces. Now, as you might imagine, this was quite scandalous. It was a shock to his local uh, white community and especially to his white relatives who would have loved to get even a fraction of that inheritance. It would have been life changing. And instead, Samuel had declared in a legal document that his enslaved children were more deserving of it than his white relatives. So as you might expect, there was a great deal of litigation, four years of lawsuits. But in the end, in 1860, his will was declared valid his children were emancipated and they began to inherit a portion of their father's wealth. And that's just the beginning of the story. Um, it has, as Marty well knows, um, you know, the Townsends in the years and decades after their emancipation, they migrated across the American South and West. Members of the family ended up in Ohio, in Kansas, in Colorado's Rocky Mountains, and some back to Alabama um, after the Civil War. And in all of their journeys, they were seeking opportunities for social and economic mobility. They were trying to build stable lives for themselves in freedom. And essentially, they were pursuing the American dream. And this story following them in their journey from slavery to freedom and their physical journey across the country is really an exploration of their experiences of race and freedom as they pursued that dream. The opportunities that were open to them as a result of their inheritance, both the monetary inheritance as well as the more ambiguous inheritance of their mixed race ancestry, as well as the obstacles that they faced at different times and different places when racism and prejudice closed doors to opportunities for them and frustrated their choices. Well, I want to dive into some of those specifics in a minute, but before we get there, let, let's talk about your source base because so much of your book stems from one really remarkable cache of letters that you found. And I'm wondering if you can just say a little bit about that archive that really gave birth to this Absolutely. book. Absolutely. Yeah, so, you know, if you look at a uh, any page of the 100 pages of footnotes in the book, um, you will see the phrase SD Cabinet Papers, University of Alabama. And the Cabinet Papers is a collection held at my alma mater, UA, Roll Tide. Um, and it is comprised of about 15,000 individual items that were preserved by an attorney in Huntsville in the 19th century named Septimus Douglas Cabinus, S.D. Cabinus. And he was Samuel Townsend's attorney, his, the executor of his will, and pretty much the, the man who ensured that his will was upheld and that his children were freed. Um, and so he, being the meticulous lawyer that he was, saved all these documents, Family members preserved them until 1950 when his granddaughter, Frances Cabanis Roberts, donated the entire collection to the University of Alabama, where she had done her master's thesis on the Townsend family using those same papers. And so what's really incredible about that collection is because is that it includes two boxes, about 175, a little more than that, letters written by members of the Townsend family themselves. This is a really remarkable cache of archival materials because these are first person narratives written by formerly enslaved people, Samuel's children, Edmund's children, their mothers, their uh, mother's children by enslaved men. So really a collection that you don't see a lot when you're studying slavery. Studying enslaved people, especially enslaved women, can be very difficult because of the gaps in the source base that you encounter. The fact that there is a collection of 170 odd letters written by members of the same family shortly after their emancipation from slavery is just really incredible. And it allows me to get a lot of detailed information and information about individuals, uh, thoughts, their hopes, their dreams, and family dynamics that really, I don't think, are available for the vast, vast majority of enslaved families that you find in the historical record. Well, I think one of the really remarkable things about your book is that you, you have that sort of the, that cache of letters, but you're not just writing about them. You really do a beautiful job of letting us hear the voice of the writers of those letters. 
Um, and those voices of these individuals come through so vividly. And I wonder if you could just talk about how you figured out how to do that, how you learned to trust those voices, how you decided you would let their voices take such a pride of place in your book. Right. I mean, that is what's really significant to me about the collection is that these letters have allowed me to share the voices of enslaved people that haven't been heard in 150 years. And that at the time when the Townsends were speaking in their lives went unheard at that time because they weren't, weren't considered you know, meaningful. They weren't considered, uh, they were second class citizens in many respects. And so their voices weren't heard by Cabinus the lawyer, by many of their contemporaries, by white neighbors. But we have these records that, that give us a glimpse into what their lives were like. And you know, the letters themselves are complicated sources because you always have to keep in mind the fact that they were written pretty much entirely to the lawyer cabinets. So they are not writing to each other in most of the letters. There are a, a few where two brothers are writing um, back and forth, one in Colorado, one in Alabama, and they're much more open in discussing political opinions, personal experiences, reminiscing about their lives in Alabama before they were freed. The majority of those letters were written by members of the Townsends to the lawyer cabinets, who was himself a slave owner before the Civil War, was a Confederate financial officer. They know exactly who they're writing to, and so they're crafting their letters for that audience. But even so, you do get a sense of their individuality, the things that are of concern to them, the things that they find important, because the very fact that they're writing these letters means that they were asserting their rights. They were making claims to their rights as Samuel and Edmund Townsend's children, as citizens after the Civil War. And the fact that the letters themselves exist gives us a glimpse into their character that they weren't people who were going to, you know, let injustice um, happen to them. And in many cases, you know, they had no choice about that when they were faced with systemic racism and other obstacles. But in the things they had control about, in their inheritance, uh, they were going to advocate for their rights. And I think that may be why their voices do come across strongly in their letters, because they were strong people. And I know I'm a historian. I didn't know the Townsends. I'm never going to meet them personally unless, you know, time travel uh, happens. My husband's a physicist. Maybe he's working on it. I don't know. But even not knowing these individuals personally, looking at the records, I don't think it's a stretch to read their words and get a sense of the strength of their character um, and, and who they were as people. So your book is what I, I would call a micro history. That is, you're, you're focused on a very particular family, but you're using your focus on that family to tell a much broader story. Um, and so in this case, although you're focused on the Townsends, you're really trying to use their experiences, I think, to illuminate much larger questions about slavery and freedom. And I'm going to try to tease out some of those bigger stories, okay? Sure. So um, as you noted, you, you track members of the Townsend family from Alabama to Ohio to Kansas to Colorado back to Alabama. And it's, it seems to me that you're kind of laying out a story about the geographies of freedom. That is, freedom doesn't look the same in each of these places, uh, either before or after emancipation in 1865. So I wonder if you could talk for a bit about how place, how geography, how those state boundaries matter to the experiences of the people that you're writing about. No, you're absolutely right that geography and place plays a role in the experiences that different members of the Townsend family who settled in different places in the country have over the course of the second half of the 19th century. And the fact that it takes place in the second half of the 19th century is really important because this was a radically transformative period in American history. The Townsends were freed in 1860, one year before the outbreak of the Civil War. And I follow them in their lives to the, the early 20th century, um, when a number of the family members um, die in the 19-teens and 1900s. And so they're kind of bookended by the racial regime of slavery, in which blackness in the United States was associated with enslavement and the racial regime of the Jim Crow period, which is when uh, the one drop rule came about that you know, basically established that if you have any African ancestry, no matter how far in the past, if you have one drop of African blood, you are considered black for all intents and purposes. You are a second class citizen in the United States. That's the Jim Crow period. And the Townsends are in this in-between period 
where the racial regime in the United States was in flux. Racial hierarchies had been upended by the Civil War, and that gave members of the Townsend family, and not just the Townsends, but freed people in general, different opportunities that they couldn't experience before the war or after the establishment of a Jim Crow state. And so that we end up seeing in the different places that the Townsends settle. You know, the family members who settle in Southern Ohio, uh, when they arrive, there are local whites who are trying to drive them out of town because these are uh, areas, counties that are populated by Southern migrants who may be anti-slavery, but they certainly don't want former slaves living in their town. At the same time, you have one son, Charles Osborne, who with other relatives ends up in Colorado's Rocky Mountains, where he experiences a really exceptional level of social and political equality because in Colorado, African-American migrants don't really seem like a threat. They come in such small numbers that they're not competition for jobs. They're not a voting block. When Charles Osborne arrived in Colorado in the late 1860s, there were 500, less than 500 African Americans in the entire Colorado territory. Uh, in the town where he ended up, Georgetown, less than 12. So these are individuals who are integrated pretty seamlessly into the community because they have a shared religion. They're all Christian. They have a shared uh, culture and customs. They're miners and farmers, just like their white neighbors. The real outsiders in Georgetown, Colorado, are the Chinese migrants who are <coughs> Uh, attempting to mine for silver. This is a big silver mining uh, boom time in, in Colorado history, who are opening businesses like laundries in town and who aren't assimilating into white society. They don't have the same religion. They don't have the same customs. And that holds as well for Native Americans like the Ute peoples, who were the original inhabitants of Colorado and that region. So when someone like Charles Osborne Townsend, who is an educated African-American man with some property, some capital behind him, if he comes in and wants to farm or mine, he looks more like us than them if you compare him to a Chinese migrant or to a Native American who's living on the you know, White River Reservation nearby. And so that different geography gave him an opportunity that his relatives who stayed in Ohio didn't have because in this fluid period in the second half of the 19th century, communities made their own rules about race and racial hierarchies. And the rules in Colorado were very different from the rules in Ohio or in Huntsville, Alabama, or in Leavenworth, Kansas. Well, it certainly becomes a surprising piece of your story as, as you're following all these relatives uh, through time that, that one person comes back to Alabama, purchases Part of the family plantation yeah and becomes a politician during reconstruction his story is really amazing thomas townsend was one of samuel's um, sons he was i think exactly the middle son and after the civil war um he's had some education the younger children were sent to wilberforce university in ohio after their emancipation but it closed during the war he ended up with family members in kansas and around 1869 he decides he's going to go back to huntsville uh, why he does this? Well, he's certainly very brave because at the time, the KKK was terrorizing African Americans in Northern Alabama and throughout the state. And yet Thomas is writing letters back and forth with the lawyer Kavanis as if, you know, he has no fears in the world. And I think part of that has to do with the fact that Thomas, alone among his siblings, really worked hard to maintain a relationship with the lawyer, Kavanis. He kept Kavanis on his side. And if you read his letters, you can absolutely see where he is playing that lawyer like a fiddle. He is saying, oh, I feel, I feel so bad for all the Southern planters where Yankees came in and took their land. Gosh, that must be hard. And I mean, he is, he is really using every tool he has in his arsenal to keep that relationship going because he knows Kavanis controls the estate. He controls disbursements from the estate. And so while other members of his family are rightly annoyed and frustrated and angry when the Civil War stops disbursements, when Kavanis is not doing all they think he should to get them their inheritance, Thomas is you know, making a very shrewd, calculated maneuver. So when he decides to go back to Alabama, 
he has Cabinus fully on board. Cabinus is setting up job interviews for him. He's saying, oh, you'll be fine. You can work here, you can work here. So Thomas knows when he goes to Huntsville, he is gonna have the white establishment at his back and that's going to help him in his attempt to achieve social and economic mobility. And he does do that. Thomas, um, he is, is very, very good at husbanding the inheritance that he receives from the estate. He uses it to purchase property, a small farm, right away when he gets to Alabama. He runs a school for freed people, sometimes teaching more than 100 students in a classroom at a time. And he ends up kind of leveraging that wealth and that capital to get to the point where when some of Samuel's property is put up for auction uh, in the 1870s, he's able to purchase a piece of one of those <coughs> plantations where his family had been enslaved. And I think the critical thing is that he doesn't do that for his own advantage. He does it because two other enslaved people who had lived on the Townsend Plantation, they're not related to him by blood, but they were the in-laws of one of Thomas's brothers, uh, two men named Shadrach and General Townsend. They wanted to buy that land, but they didn't have the capital. So Thomas put up a third of it and immediately signed over the deed to his extended kin. He is showing that he is going to use the wealth and privilege that he has as one of Samuel Townsend's heirs to help the local community, to help other freed people in Madison County. And he takes on a leadership role, not only within his family with the lawyer Cavanis, but in the community as a politician, not even during Reconstruction, after Reconstruction, after white Southerners have taken back uh, legislators that were once controlled by radical Republicans in the state. And he does that by, again, using his strategy of making alliances with elite individuals who have the power to make change and maintaining those alliances in order to get kind of incremental benefit for the local black community in Huntsville. Well, that's interesting. And that really relates to something that struck me when I was reading the book. It sometimes struck me as I was reading all these letters uh, to the lawyer, between the siblings, that really, What's keeping this family together is not love or shared experience, it's money. Mm -hmm. Or the possibility of money, or the promise of money. So uh, I wonder if you can reflect on that a little bit. Uh, these people are bound together because they need that lawyer to disperse uh, Samuel Townsend's right. estate. I think that there is definitely an element of that in work uh, at work in the Townsend family. They are, you know, by the time we get into the 1870s and 80s, some of them are living a thousand miles apart, Rocky Mountains to Huntsville, Alabama, and yet they keep in communication. And any of those letters between Charles Osborne in Colorado and Thomas Townsend in Huntsville, you can be sure that they are going to talk about the state of Samuel Townsend's property. They are always trying to come up with a new way to get money out of the estate to keep on top of the news, to make sure that everyone in the family is in the loop with what the next lawsuit is, what's going on. Part of the problem is that Samuel Townsend's estate was very much devalued by the Civil War. Uh, and so by the time communication between the Townsends in the North and Cabinets in the South has been restored after the war, because it was cut off for several years, uh, the estate isn't worth as much money as it originally had been, and they never end up getting the full inheritance they had been promised and had been counting on for the future. So there's a lot of legal wrangling that continues well into uh, the 1870s and 80s. The estate isn't finally settled until 1890, the year after Cabinus dies. So this is a long-term process, and the Townsends do keep in contact uh, to maintain lines of communication about the estate. But I think as much as that's the case, there are also hints in the letters about the personal bonds that do keep them connected. Um, it's not a strictly uh, financial consideration that keeps Charles writing to Thomas. Those are some of the only letters we have written by members of the family. Um, and they're really a wealth of information about family dynamics because there's no cabinets involved. This is just brother to brother. And they talk about memories uh, of their lives under slavery. Charles writes in one that I think is really poignant. You know, Wade and I sit around every Sunday on the porch and we talk about what it was like back in Alabama. And it's just, you get a, a tiny glimpse of these conversations that have been completely lost to time. You will never hear uh, folks who lived 150 years ago 
having this conversation, but you know what happened because of this letter. Because of these letters, I know that they send photographs of each other back and forth. They ask for information on their new marriage or their new children that are born. And I think, you know, that goes to show that while while the letters, I think, exist because of their interest in the estate, the Townsends did have a bond um, as family members that was built on interest in the property, but built also on something else, shared experiences. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's interesting that you, you do feel like you got to know them pretty well. Or you, you feel like you got to know them pretty well. I hope. Yeah. You know, but it's, I, I've written about characters from the 19th century, and I know I prefer writing about 19th century people to 21st century people because they can't argue back with me. You know, uh, I, I can make an assessment about them and say, this is what they must have thought or what they wanted to do. Um, but then I found descendants. <laughs> And, and uh, really made me a more responsible writer. And I'm wondering if you had experiences like that. Did you try to track down any of the Townsends, or did they hear about your work and contact you? And if so, what have those conversations been like? Right, so I, I started doing this work when I was an undergraduate. I was a junior in college, uh, and somehow one of my undergraduate papers ended up on the University of Alabama Library website. So anybody who is doing genealogy about the Townsend family, they're going to come right to this paper, they're going to find out my name, and they can easily find my contact information because I'm, I'm all over the internet. Um, and so I did get contacted by descendants of uh, some of Townsend's children as early as early graduate school. And at that point, I wasn't ready for it, I don't think. I wasn't expecting it. Obviously, you know, you think the 19th century, all told, isn't that long ago. Uh, there are definitely descendants who know their family history that far back, so, you know, logically you might get contacted, but I wasn't thinking about that. And I'm so lucky that the descendants who I did speak to over the years have been so generous with their time, so forthcoming about their stories and their interest in their family history and what it means to them. And so knowing that you know they are reading my material, knowing that they are interested in this and that it means something to them that it can't ever mean to me because I, I'm not a descendant, um, has really always stuck in my mind as I've been researching and writing because I want to do their family justice. And for me, part, part of that means that I don't want to treat the Townsends just as vehicles for historical argumentation. I want to write about them as people, as individuals with you know, deep inner lives and hopes and dreams of their own. And you're absolutely right. I feel like I know the Townsends from their letters. I don't really know the Townsends. I have to hope that if somehow they read it, they would recognize at least a part of the portrait that I have painted, but I don't know if that's the case. But my goal really was to depict their lives with empathy, with compassion, and with nuance so that readers come away with the sense that these aren't just distant historical actors, they were people who had experiences like us. And that's a service I wanted to do, you know, as a historian for descendants of the Townsend family who already knew that they were people just like us because they're in their family tree. And that's something that, that I hope I have done. Um, and I'm just, I know I've been very fortunate to talk to some really wonderful folks who who are interested in this story in, in a very real and personal way. Well, how, how would you describe your interactions with them? Uh, that is, do you feel like they've given you more information or have you given them more information? Have you been exchanging stories? And is there anything specific in particular that you learned about them that you couldn't have known from reading the letters? Yeah, so I'm not sure. I mean, the, the interchange has been, I have been able to direct some descendants to resources online that they might not have known about. You know, I when the cabinet papers at the University of Alabama were digitized, I was already very familiar with the collection. I could say, you know, here is a link to a document where your ancestor is named. Here is a link to a document written by your ancestor. And so I was happy to be able to do that just because my <laughs> deep dive into research had made me familiar with the collection. From them, I have gotten so many stories from generations that followed the Townsends. You know, I follow the story from Samuel and Edmund's generation, the mothers of the Townsend children's generation, the Townsends, and then some of their kids. But descendants, you know, can trace that all the way down to the, the future. And so knowing, you know, some of the more recent stories, and by recent, I still mean you know, a few generations back, 
but, but seeing how members of the Townsend family, how, where they ended up across the country, because they continue to spread across the country and end up in, in very different places, um, to know that that migration continued, that their uh, attempts to build more stable lives for themselves continued, their successes, and sometimes you know the obstacles they faced, those stories didn't get in the book necessarily, but they have helped me think about the Townsends, you know, as, as a family that, that really lived. Mm -hmm. I want to circle back to something you, you talked about early on. You were talking about the one drop rule. So, you know, there were laws in many American states, as you were suggesting, that if one of your eight great grandparents was mm -hmm. black, you were legally black, you were riding in the Jim Crow cars, et cetera. So the Townsends were all mixed race. And as I recall from the book, you really couldn't find photographs of them. So do you get a sense from reading the letters of how, how, how they exploited or used or denied or took advantage of their, their phenotype, what they looked like right. as they navigate this complicated um, post-emancipation world? Yeah, so you're right that the Townsends, uh, I have not been able to find any photographs <clears throat> or uh, images of any of the, the Townsends mentioned in this book save one, William Bolden Townsend, who was a, a grandson of Samuel, the son of Samuel's eldest son, Wesley. There is a grainy newspaper photograph and then a sketch of him that was done when he was running um, for a, a local political office in the 1890s. So that's the only visual depiction of any of the Townsends I have. But in the cabinet's collection, not so much in the Townsends' letters themselves, but in other documents um, surrounding those letters, there are individuals who describe the Townsend's physical appearance. Uh, Cabanus, the lawyer himself, he's always trying to push them to go live outside the country. You know, saying, if you go to Mexico, you'll look like everybody there, it'll be fine. Go to Indian territory, go to Haiti. So he, you know, he describes um, these mixed race individuals with the language of the slave trade, some, you know, language like mulattoes, like uh, yellow or, or other, um, descriptions that slave owners like Cabanus was would use to describe an enslaved person's <clears throat> physical appearance. Some other sources that hint at their mixed race ancestry include one Freedman's Bureau agent who was writing to another saying, this woman Milka Townsend, um, Milka Caldwell at the time she had married, she came in, she said this, she said that, and he says, I wouldn't have known the woman was an African if he hadn't seen that she had a husband with darker skin. So there you know, are hints that if they had wanted, maybe some members of the Townsend family could have passed across the color line and passed as white. But the thing is, at the time they lived, they didn't need to because this wasn't uh, the Jim Crow era with the one drop rule. And I was really influenced by Martha Hodes, historian Martha Hodes' concept of shading towards whiteness as opposed to passing as white. Because in the 19th century, during this kind of fluid in-between period, there were other factors than skin color that could affect your social status, your education, other markers of class status, like the clothes you wore, the way you spoke, whether you owned land, whether you owned a home. All of these were factors that could shade you closer towards the social status of whiteness, even though everyone knew you were formerly a slave or that you were descended from enslaved people. So I think that's where we see the Townsends kind of moving on this fluid racial spectrum. They achieved in some cases a social status closer to whiteness, um, even though it, with one exception, they never attempted to pass across the color line. Well, but am I not correct if it, if, that if they passed as white, they would lose their chance to get the inheritance? It's possible uh, because if they attempted to pass as white, you know, and then a community member who didn't know them as the formerly enslaved child of Samuel Townsend heard about their relationship with Cabinets back in Alabama, that would raise questions. There was one member of the family who did pass as white, um, Elizabeth Lizzie Townsend, who was one of Edmund's um, daughters. And she, after the Civil War, married a Civil War veteran, um, moved to North Carolina, and subsequently in city directories and censuses, she's listed as white. Now, whether her, and her husband as well, was listed as white. So it's possible he never knew about her 
uh, ancestry. That would be a big question when she started getting disbursements from the estate, so it's very possible he did know, or perhaps he was passing himself. These questions are things I can't really answer with the sources I have, but it is an interesting uh, question whether they chose not to pass because they didn't want to lose out on the inheritance. Although, to be honest, uh, there was a certain point at which there was no more money forthcoming from the inheritance, after which really anything goes, and they still um, they still built communities with their identities as the formerly enslaved children of Samuel and Edmund Townsend. This might be an unfair question, but there's a lot of people in this book. How, how did you keep everybody straight? Did you have a family tree glued to your bedroom wall that you studied at night? I mean, did, um, oh gosh, you know, drawing the family tree for the book was actually the hardest thing because I hadn't had a family tree until I needed one for, for this physical object. I had a spreadsheet um, with names, dates of birth, you know, where I could find each piece of information and who was related to whom. And it was, it still confuses me sometimes. Um, there are three pages in the index that are just the names of Townsend's, and some of them have the same name. A lot of Elizabeths, uh, to be sure, over many generations. Um, but I think the fact that I started working on this so long ago that over time it just became natural to me. Like, yeah, well, this Elizabeth is called Lizzie, and she's the daughter of Lizzie Paraben Townsend. And, you know, it just, it just. Uh, I think at this point it seems natural to me, so I always find myself needing to explain more because I know that not everyone has the kind of uh, engraved uh, family tree in their heads. You know, I, th I think most of us who work on books that take a long time can sometimes look back and go, aha, there was an aha moment where you find something that you just didn't expect to find, or you find something, maybe you were looking for it, but you, it says something you didn't think it would say. Did you have any moments like that while you were working on this book that just made you stop in your tracks and have to rethink things? There's one I can definitely think of, and my grad school roommates, some of whom are in the room, uh, may remember that I had a whiteboard in my bedroom and scrawled across it in um, red ink was just, who is Lizzie? With lots of question marks. Because there was one Lizzie that I kept coming across references to, and I had no idea who she was. I knew that she was an enslaved person owned by Edmund Townsend, I came to find that she had essentially been kidnapped into slavery. She was born um, to a white woman and an African-American man. I don't know whether he was enslaved or free, but it doesn't matter because his mother, her mother being white meant she was a free-born woman. Um, and she ended up, uh, when, her, when her mother passed away, her uncle um, sold her into slavery through multiple slave traders who, and she ended up with Edmund Townsend. I had no idea why she was important or why this lawyer Cavanus was writing so much about her or digging so deeply into her past until I finally came across, you know, one letter, and I don't remember what it was, but it all clicked together that she was the mother of two of Edmund Townsend's children. She was the mother of Edmund's daughters. And it mattered whether or not she was born free or not, because if she had been born free, that his daughters had always been free, and therefore they uh, were owed Edmund Townsend's estate, which had been dispersed to other folks already. The daughters were bringing a suit saying, we have always been free because our mother was illegally enslaved, therefore that $500,000 you gave to Samuel and you gave to Parks and Stiff, that belongs to us. Um, and so S.D. Cavanis, the lawyer, really had to work hard to try to prove that they were, in fact, enslaved um, children. And that's why Lizzie's identity mattered so much. But that was, you know, one aha moment that I can think of really distinctly. That's interesting. So, you know, as you mentioned, you, you started talk, working on this when you were an undergraduate. Um, if you had sat down to write this book without having gone to graduate school, would it be the same book? I, could, I don't think I could have done it. I mean, I think graduate school was, it gave me the time and financial resources and opportunity and guidance, like from you, my advisor, to do a deep dive into the research. If I had, you know, written it as an undergraduate or shortly after that, I wouldn't have been able to look at all of the variety of sources that I did. I wouldn't have been able to spend years thinking about it and doing more secondary reading as a grad student to provide context, context for the research I was doing. Um, it, it would have been a different book. It would have been a much worse book if it had been written at all. I, I really 
I, I definitely needed graduate school to turn this from a passable research paper, which it was when I was an undergraduate, into a, a finished product. A good finished product. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, as Madeline noted when she introduced you, you've worked for the past few years as a public historian. You worked for several years at the 9-11 Museum and the Exhibitions Department. Now you're working for a regional African American History Museum, continuing to work for the Princeton Slavery Project. I wonder if that work, which is so outward facing, where you're, you're speaking to school groups who come in or to visitors, you're writing labels. When I worked in museums, we were supposed to write labels for people with an eighth grade reading level. I don't know what the rule is now. Um, I, I wonder if you can talk about how that work as a public historian has shaped your work as a writer. Because certainly you shape this book as a narrative history. Your, your book tells a story. It starts here. There's these tensions. There's a rising arc. There's a actually a lovely dramatic ending. Does that way of thinking about writing come out of your work experience, or I think that you know, being a public historian, working in museums and other public-facing projects like Princeton Slavery, has really made me think about audience much more intensely than I think I would have if I, you know, when I was in grad school or if I had decided to take a more academic track in my career. Because in all of my more public facing work, I am not writing for my dissertation committee. I'm not preparing content for scholars in the field. And while I hope that scholars in the field would read and find something valuable in the book that I have written, I really have in the writing process been thinking about other people who might be interested in this topic, how to engage them, how to draw them into the story, and really what their needs as readers are. Because their needs as, as readers might not be the you know, in-depth scholarly debates uh, over, over various terminology or various historiographical trends that you might find in some of my footnotes. Um, and so thinking about audience, I think that having this experience in the public history and in the museum world has given me a broader perspective on that, on what um, what interests general audiences or more general audiences. Because for a very long time, I was in grad school writing for my peers, for fellow scholars, um, and thinking along that track. And writing for a larger audience is, is a very different skill set. Well, it shouldn't be a different skill set. I mean, I, I actually think everything that you write, people write in graduate school should be for a broad audience like this. And you make me think of um, something that my own graduate school mentor told my class the day that he won the Pulitzer Prize. We asked him, um, who, who do you write for? Who's your imagined audience? And he said, an intelligent Martian. <laughs> and we were dumbfounded. And I remember finally raising my hand and said, sir, uh, an intelligent Martian, and he goes, yes, I always imagine my reader is very smart, but I never imagine that they know anything about my topic. And I, I write for intelligent Martians, or I try to, and do you have an imagined reader out there? I do. My imagined reader is in the audience. Um, I, I write, or at least, you know, I said when I was writing my dissertation, writing this manuscript, I wanted to write it so that my husband, who is a very smart man, but he has the downside of being a physicist, not a historian, uh, so that he would understand it. Because I know that he is going to you know, be a very intelligent reader and commenter on my work, but he might not know everything about reconstruction that I know. So, you know, I want to give the context to allow an intelligent physicist to, to read my work. But I think Martian works just as well. I, I think physicists are Martians, so I think we're okay there. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I, I think we'll, we'll stop here and, and, and take some audience uh, questions from the audience first in the room, and then we'll switch to people watching on Zoom. Why do you think the attorney? Just wait. Why do you wait for the mic? I'm sorry. Online. I'm sorry. Why do you think the attorney actually um, worked on this to the benefit of the beneficiaries of the will? He was a slave owner. He was a southerner. He didn't really have any dog in this fight, so to speak. But he did so with great vigor, I assume, unless he absconded with 90% of the estate. Why do you think he did this? He could have just as easily, you know, blown it off or or or, or somehow. Not, not persecuted or prosecuted as successfully as he did. No, you're right. Cavanis is an interesting figure because you can see in his letters, in his notes and documents, he very much had the racial prejudices of 
the aristocratic elite Southern class that he was a part of. Uh, but he did do a good job as the executor. He was a very diligent executor. And part of it, I think, is when he started, he didn't know this was going to outlive him. He had no idea that he was going to be working on this until his death. Um, and he, it, you know, later in his career, um, some years after the Civil War, he wrote to uh, Thomas, he wrote, if I had known what this was going to turn into, I would have turned this job down. Um, because he was so frustrated by all the demands, he thought there were unreasonable demands that members of the Townsend family were making on him to get the inheritance they had been promised. Um, and part of that is, uh, you know, he could have he could have absconded with the money. He didn't, uh, which you know, I guess kudos to him for that. For all his many other sins, he did the job he was paid to do. He was paid very well to do this job. Uh, he was paid three thousand dollars a year. That's almost as much as uh, $3,000 is nearly as much as some members of the Townsend family received at all from their inheritance. So there was certainly a financial motivation. But the Townsends themselves hit on another motivation for him. Some of them in their letters would write, you know, I know you're going to do this for me because you're a gentleman of the South. And gentlemen of the South do not betray trust. And so they are, you know, very shrewdly uh, analyzing his character and saying, you know, we are going to, to hit him where uh, he really can't deny us because he wants to think of himself as a Southern gentleman. At one point, he writes to the Townsends, you know, if you come back to Alabama, you can choose me as your master and it'll just be, it'll just all be better. It'll all work out. And he thinks of himself as a benevolent slave owning man. He thinks of himself as a gentleman. They recognize that and they're going to use that to their advantage. And, you know, he, he does fulfill his job in getting the Townsends freed. He does his best to get uh, debts paid to the estate after the Civil War when the estate has been so heavily devalued. Um, and so I think that there's a, a combination of him feeling the need to do his duty as a lawyer, as a gentleman, but also he was making a lot of money off of it himself. Even if he wasn't cheating them, he was still being, a, being paid a great deal. Yeah, here in the front row. Just wait for the microphone just a second. Um, at this time, uh, landed, moneyed, um, educated blacks were certainly not common. And I wonder if you have any, if you found any um, information as to how they thought of themselves. Did they think of themselves as mixed race, as black, white, or, and how did they? Did any of them try to use that in any way? No. Yeah, I think as with you know many other aspects of their lives, there was a great diversity in opinion among members of the Townsend family. Wesley Townsend, Samuel's eldest son, he lived in Southern Ohio for a while, and he would write letters complaining about the, the contrabands who were coming into town, fugitives from slavery uh, before and after the Civil War, who were coming into town working for food alone and driving down wages. And they disliked him, and he complained, they call me a butternut, which was the color of uniform. Uh, it was what was used to describe Confederate uniforms in the press. So they're saying, you're a Confederate. He's saying, you're you know, driving down wages. He says he has no friends because he's not a black abolitionist. So he is kind of using his mixed race ancestry and his promised wealth to separate himself from the local black community. The same is true with his cousin Woodson, one of Edmund's sons, who uh, is falsely accused of raping a white woman. He, thanks in part to his financial security and his links to elite whites in the Kansas area where he lived, he escapes um, execution and he escapes a lynch mob and ends up uh, being sent to prison for six years, uh, which is, you know, considered a compromise verdict. That's what they call it in the press, even though he he, he was innocent, um, but he still served time, and that was really the best outcome for him. But when he was arrested, local black community leaders convened a meeting at the Baptist church, and they issued a resolution saying, we totally abjure this man. Um, whatever he gets, that's what's coming to him, because he has never considered himself uh, one of us. He has always considered himself a white man. So maybe white men will help him. Um, and then on the other side, we have 
figures like Thomas Townsend, who is using his financial resources to assist his local community. We have William Bolden Townsend, Wesley's son, who in the 1890s and early 1900s is a staunch civil rights activist who faces down lynch mobs himself uh, because he's a lawyer defending men like Woodson who are falsely accused of rape or other crimes. Uh, and then far west, we have Charles Osborne, who comes to consider himself more of a Westerner than anything else. And for him, region is more important than race. So I think that question really gets to you know, a critical point in the book, which is, meanings of race, experiences of race and freedom changed so radically depending where you were, depending on um, you know, what community you lived in, that we could have this, this broad diversity of opinion, even within this one family. Have you discovered any new information since writing the book that didn't make it into this particular story? Yeah, thank you. Um, that is actually the case. As of two weeks ago, I received an email out of the blue from a bookseller and antiquarian in California who had come across a letter uh, addressed to a man named Samuel Townsend in Alabama. And I assume he starts you know, Googling Samuel Townsend in Alabama. He comes up with my book, um, and he emailed me to say, you know, here's a transcript of this letter, what do you make of it? And the letter that he sent me was uh, a physician writing to Samuel Townsend in 1836 saying, I'm taking care of your girl who has a bad fever, I think she's going to recover, but there was, you know, an injury to one of her eyes, and I don't think I'm going to be able to save it. Uh, and, you know, the antiquarium writes me to ask, do you think this girl he's talking about might be one of his daughters? Well, the dates don't work out. Samuel's daughters were uh, born after the time that the letter was written, but it's very, very likely that this physician was writing about an enslaved girl or woman that Samuel Townsend owned. And I remember that in my research, I'd come across an inventory written in 1858, which uh, Cabanus, the lawyer, and his fellow executor, um, a nephew of Samuel, uh, they wrote down the names, ages, and any injuries of all the enslaved people Samuel Townsend owned. Because if their attempt to get the will probated failed, all those individuals would be sold. So they needed to know their financial value. And one of those uh, individuals listed was a woman named Jane, who was born, um, uh, don't make me do math on the spot. She would have been 18 in 1836 when the letter was written. And she was described as having one eye and so I was able to say, you know, we can't say for sure, but maybe this was the woman who was written about in the letter, that this was Jane. And, you know, I would have loved to see that letter before I wrote the book, but I never would have seen that letter if this man didn't know about the book, if he hadn't found it and from that um, gotten my contact info. So I guess, you know, it's true that this story may have a life of its own, and I'm glad that I was able to learn a little bit more about this woman who until then had just been a name on an inventory. Now I know a little bit more about her, that she was with this family trying to take care of her, not necessarily out of the kindness of Samuel's heart, but because she was an 18-year-old woman. She was a valuable property, um, both for physical labor and reproductive labor. So, you know, she's worth health care. But now we have a little bit more information about someone else who was on the towns and plantations who didn't leave other records behind, who wasn't one of Samuel's children. Thank you. Uh, take some questions from the Zoom audience. Sure, thank you. I'll read them aloud. Um, we have two that have come in so far. Uh, the first is, this story is fascinating, and I'm about halfway through the book. It seems almost unique, quite an unusual story about a white planter with mixed race to heirs, and of course, all the descendants. At the same time, though, it leads me to a lot of questions about how mixed race former enslaved persons lived after the Civil War. What, con what conclusions might we make from this story about other former enslaved persons who were able to have a certain level of capital? Yeah, that's a really interesting question because, um, you know, while this story might not be unique exactly, the Townsends were definitely the exception to the rule. They went into their new lives as free people with a level of capital, with financial security that the vast majority of free people did not benefit from after the war. And for me, it makes me wonder what America might look like in 2022 if more enslaved people had been able to benefit from the building up of generational wealth that the Townsends benefited from. 
if the Townsends weren't the exception, but were closer to the rule, uh, you know, if land redistribution, which freed people advocated so strongly for after the Civil War, had become a reality um, instead of a broken promise. And so, you know, I'm not a policymaker. I can't say what or whether some sort of reparative action should be taken, but I do know that if we're thinking about this question, then, you know, in-depth research into the historical record is the first step for any uh, further steps. And so I'm, I'm happy that, you know, this story might provide at least one concrete example of the benefits of that sort of intergenerational wealth transfer. Um, and, it, you know, I think I, like you, have a lot of questions about what it means for um, free people after the Civil War, because it's not representative. The Townsend story is not the rule. It's a rarity. But it's an interesting one that I think is, is thought provoking. Thank you. Um, one more from our virtual audience. If you could time travel and meet one character from the book, which would it be? Oh my gosh. <laughs> I'm sorry. I wish oh, I wish you hadn't asked this because I, I hate this question. I've been asked this before and I hate it. I'll, I'll let you know why. Because I'm terrified of the idea of meeting any of the Townsends. Because I, you know, I've been talking about, like, I think that Thomas was, you know, using this calculation, he was doing this. Charles Osborne believed he was more of a Westerner than anything else. And there's no way to confirm that unless I do talk to them. And there is a high likelihood that if I talk to them, I would be wrong about a lot of things. And so I think that, you know, any person, any Townsend I met, the first thing I would need to do is ask their forgiveness for all the ways in which I made mistakes, um, I would hope that they could recognize themselves. There's a wonderful book by Natalie Zeman Davis, Women on the Margins, where in her introduction, she imagines a conversation between herself and the subjects of her book. And they turn on her and they say, you better explain this because we don't like what you wrote. And I think that might be every historian's fear. So, um, you know, I, I fervently hope I don't meet any of the towns. <laughs> That's my answer. Well, hopefully the businesses won't invent time travel. Yeah, after please, all. please. Uh, in that case. I, I think on that note, we're going to wrap up. Please join me in thanking Isabella. It's a wonderful book. I hope you all us. Thank you so much for this wonderful conversation. Thank you for everyone in person and everyone online who joined us. Thank you to Labyrinth for being here. There are books back there for sale and Nobner Tom Princeton um, for co-sponsoring this event with us. So we hope you check our calendar for future events um, and have a wonderful evening. Thank you. So, what's next?